Welcome to Global Perspectives. Why is slavery such a significant problem in the 21st century? For insights, we turn to Kevin Bales, Professor of Contemporary Slavery at the University of Nottingham. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Great to be here again, John. Thank you. So let's step back a bit and, and help our viewers understand why human trafficking or contemporary slavery are such significant issues today. Why, why is that happening in Orlando and all around the world? Well, and all, yes, all around the world, you know, we now have better measurements about how many people are in slavery around the world. Our best estimate of today is about 46 million people in slavery around the world. And we think and understand, particularly from UN work, that they're generating about $150 billion a year into the economy, but fundamentally into the criminal economy. That's what criminals are making from from holding people in slavery. There's an interesting paradox though here, John, is that it is a very significant problem, and yet 46 million people is the, probably the smallest fraction of the global population of 7.3 billion that's ever been in the world. So the tiniest fraction of the global population. And likewise, that 150 billion is a very tiny fraction of the global economy. So we have a very serious moral issue and criminal issue which is also a relatively small issue in actual numbers and actual dollars. Though no one could say 46 million people is, too, is, is, is an insignificant number. No, oh, and relative to slavery populations of the past, this yes. is huge. Yes. So um, I guess what you're also saying is that because we're becoming more aware of the problem, there's a chance that it could be not 100% resolved, but largely resolved within a reasonable period of time. And what, what is that reasonable period of time? Well, you're exactly on point because we, we do believe that we can, if not completely eradicate slavery, because people will always do bad things, reduce it very, very dramatically. We know how to do it these days. We have a good understanding of the processes by which you end different types of slavery in different parts of the world. And we also have a pretty good idea about how much that costs. So we know that with adequate resources, which may be up in the billions and billions of dollars, probably something like $20 billion, it could take 20, 25 to 30 years to make that, that dr very dramatic reduction. Mm -hmm. Could you help us understand the differences between slavery past and slavery today in terms of the, the, the target uh, audience, um, in terms of geographic areas, et cetera, et cetera? That's sometimes hard to explain because slavery existed all over the world in the past. It exists all over the world today. Uh, it was legal in the past in many places. It's, uh, that's probably the key difference. It's illegal almost everywhere now. The thing that's often confusing, particularly for Americans who have in their mind this one picture of what slavery in the past looked like, which was the, the, the deep south agricultural system with captured Africans who are enslaved and working in the, in the cotton fields. But slavery's already always, always taken very many different types of forms in ways that it manifests itself. And it continues to do that today. Uh, some of them are almost perfect replicas of the past. I, I've seen things going on in the Eastern Congo right now that would have been happening in the re-enslavement in Alabama of African Americans by, by quasi-legal means in the 1880s but I, uh, virtually identical in the way they play out. So it's a difficult one, but the key is that in some ways slavery has never changed. It's always about one person under this complete control of another person, that person using violence to maintain that control, and the whole point of that control being exploitation, whether it's economic or sexual or both or in any way that they choose. Why is it, do you think, that some people have this belief that they are fully entitled to subordinate somebody. I mean, is this, is this a flaw in our human character? Well, I, I think if we looked very closely across all human characters, we'd find a number of flaws. So it, it, it certainly, it's certainly part of that. And I also have to say that slaveholders, people who are slave masters today, come in many varieties as well, but that also we know very little about their psychology and their motivations. It's very hard population to, to, to get to and, and even harder to get them talking. But we do know this. We know that in countries where discrimination is very strong, whether it's based on 
religion or ethnicity or concepts of race or gender, we know that the stronger the levels of discrimination and prejudice, the higher the levels of slavery. And we know that all over the world, men tend to not be terribly good about their interactions with women and that women are much more vulnerable to being enslaved and then children are at an even higher level of vulnerability. So in some ways, all the sorts of things that you might see around you in life today where you say, oh, here's a bit of prejudice here, here's a bit of, of criminal activity where someone's fundamentally decided I don't care about other people to the point that it's all about me and what I can get, all of those things can feed into why a person might enslave another. So what is the situation of the typical slave today as compared to, to the past? In the past, there was a rather substantial investment in, yes. in slaves. Yes. Today, that's no longer the case. You've written a book called Disposable People, and why, why that terminology? Well, the terminology was because of one of the discoveries that came about as I did the research for that book, which was uh, I was rather amazed to discover that the cost of acquiring a slave today has collapsed. It's down to a very, very low level that when I worked with historians and we tried to determine what the average price of slaves might have been in the past, the average price in today's money was up in the many tens of thousands of dollars. So buying a slave in the past, and certainly buying a slave in the Deep South before the Civil War, was almost the equivalent in today's monetary terms as buying a tractor, you know, a, a $50,000 piece of equipment. Uh, today, the cost of acquiring a person into slavery has fallen and fallen so that it might be just a few thousand dollars in the United States today or even a upper hundreds, you know, six, seven hundred dollars. In other parts of the world where things are much more poor, you can acquire a person into slavery. And I say acquire as opposed to buy because you don't even need to buy them. You can just lure them in. It's mm -hmm. just whatever you have to spend to lure them in with offers of opportunity. But that, can, that cost can be as low as $20. Hmm. And then the person is stuck in the situation of forced servitude indefinitely. Well, that's the point of slavery. You know, slavery is about this total control of a person with, with an indeterminate amount of time ahead of them. You know, one of the things that's part of the definition of slavery is that it goes on for an indeterminate amount of time. Though, again, today, I think because people are much less expensive to acquire, they're also easier to dispose of, and there's much more what you could almost call temporary enslavement, so that I've seen plenty of situations in Brazil, for example, where people are lured into a situation, taken far out into the countryside where they can be abused and enslaved without any other eyes seeing it. And they'll just be used up. They'll be just worked and worked and worked, fed very poorly, sleeping on the ground in, in malaria-infested forests, and within a month to six weeks, they're shot. I mean, they're ill, they're starving, they're sleep deprived, they've been beaten, some of them have been sexually assaulted. And at that point, they'll be loaded into a truck and taken somewhere else in the forest and dumped just to get rid of them or sometimes murdered to just get them out of way. But it's almost like a temp agency of slavery in places like Brazil. And, and how does slavery break down today, again, in comparison with the past, where so much of it was work-related slavery in the fields and so forth? Today, we have a big component of sex slavery, for example. What are some of the other types that we see? Well, there's certainly enslavement into what we would call commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, but I think there's always been a good bit of that in the past as well. And I think it's very important to explain and to remember that every woman in slavery is going to be sexually assaulted. That's almost a, one of the few truths that you can say about human behavior, is that women in slavery are sexually assaulted. It doesn't matter if they're in a field or a factory or, or taken into commercial sexual exploitation. I wish I could answer your question better because we know there are significant numbers in different types of slavery in agriculture, in very low grade, and dirty, demeaning, dangerous jobs like mining without any safety equipment all around the world and fishing, really the bottom end of the economic ladder and the dirty end of the economic ladder. But the precise breakdowns, we don't have yet. Mm -hmm. It's just very hard to, to parse those out at the point that we are with data collection today. Well, speaking of data, let, let's talk about your research project. You've come up with an approach to trying to measure 
accurately the number of, of slaves, people in human trafficking in any given area. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did this emerge and what are you trying to do with it? One of our, our great challenges has always been how can we determine how many slaves there really are? And in fact, five or so years ago, Bill Gates, who was interested in this space, said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to go work in this area because I don't have a metric. I can't I don't have a, a good notion of how big the problem is, and I, I won't be able to measure my success or failure. So in something that I work on with a big team called the Global Slavery Index, we, we worked on ways that we could begin to measure this. And we discovered that in the poorer countries, the developing countries, there is a way. We can use random sample surveys to get at the basics through interviewing the families of people who might have been enslaved. But in the rich countries, we face, face this very particular problem, which was that Surveys wouldn't work. There were too few people enslaved in these in rich, country, rich countries' populations, like the United States. And they're much better hidden because the law enforcement is, is better. And we had to find a way, if we could, to, to, to crack open that problem, to get at the, the actual numbers. Especially important because the rich countries actually have the resources to deal with the problem if they can identify where the problem is or its size. We managed to find a technique that had been used for measuring mass, mass atrocity. It's called multiple systems estimation, but it's a slightly arcane mathematical way of, 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 of estimating out from things you know to things you don't know. And we did that first for the country of Great Britain and using both governmental sources of information and as well as non-governmental. And we were able to come up with a very reliable number of, that we think is the the amount of people in slavery in the United Kingdom today, which is about 13,000, plus or minus a, a certain factor. The important thing was that the government immediately took hold of that number and changed policy and allocated more resources and used it to plan law enforcement responses and so forth. And the model that we use has now been adapted by some other countries. But the United States hasn't yet done so. And, uh, it, part of it was to do with the fact the federal system makes it difficult to do anything that covers the whole country. So what we wanted to do was with our friends here in Central Florida, with the University of Central Florida, but also with the task force that deals with this issue in Central Florida, to try this technique and to come up with a regional estimate to say we believe the total number of enslaved people in these four counties of Central Florida is X. Now, I, I can't tell you what X is, not because I'm being coy, but because we're in the process of calculating and working through that number now. Mm -hmm. And how long does that process take? Is this a matter of months, longer than that? It, it's months, it is months, and that's, that's the good news. I mean, in some ways, the actual calculation of this number takes about, this is, you'll laugh, I think, when I tell you, it takes about 15 seconds because we have the computer programs written and we just have to plug in the numbers. The, the longer part is the organizations that share information with us to make this possible have to collect their information from their cases. They, we then have to make it into a uniform kind of uh, system that we can draw the number from. Uh, we need it, it to happen after, say, at least three or four months of casework. Uh, a year would be even better from, from the participating organizations. So in some ways, it's about finding all that information out and getting it all in the same place. But uh, the organizations around the task force, the Greater Orlando Task Force, are, are contributing their data and are working together to make that happen. So I suspect within two or three months we'll have that number. Help us understand the significance of this research. It sounds very groundbreaking. It, and it's happening for the first time in the United States in Central Florida. That's right, and I, and I think that alone is groundbreaking, the fact that we can do it at a regional level and not a national level. But the key thing is that I think anywhere you go in the United States, and I have to say in other well-off countries as well, but absolutely within the United States, you know, well, let me say it this way. I've had the same conversation with state legislatures, leg legislators, as well as people in the U.S. Congress who say to me, I think this is an important issue. I'd really like to get behind it. I'd be happy to back alloc allocations or appropriations, but I can't get any numbers. I need to know how big this problem is. It's like trying to solve a, an epidemic without knowing 
any epidemiological information about how many people are ill, might be ill, could get ill, might be susceptible, and so forth. So the key here is that it unlocks the door to rational planning to address a very serious problem, which has never been possible before. It's been this floating, dark, occluded, cloudy issue. And a lot of people didn't feel nervous about devoting resources, whether it's police or social services or government time, um, to solve that problem. But once you get a number that's reliable and you're able to say this is the size and shape of the problem, then you've got something to work with. Talk to us a bit about how public awareness of this issue has changed in recent years. And do you feel that there's a, a growing tide of support for ending this problem? Oh, I do very much think that there's a growing tide because uh, I mean, it really feels like one of those tipping points has occurred in the last two or three years. You can see it at so many levels. Uh, there's been an enormous shift of particularly philanthropic resources behind this issue. There was a time when no big foundations were, were interested in this, mainly because it didn't cross their radar or it was too vague. It was, slight, it was a serious problem, but it was hard to pin down what, what one might do. Uh, we've seen that come to an end. And, and large foundations, global foundations, are now investing into this space and seeing this as a space where they can uh, invest strategically and, and with strategic outcomes. So they can say, we, we know that if we put in this much money, this, mon m this many people will come out of slavery and a crea create a situation in which their communities become not just slave-free, but slave-proof. So we solve the problem. But also, the number of politicians talking about it, the number of newspaper articles, the number of television programs, the number of local groups that are founding in churches and schools are proliferating like crazy. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to knock wood, as we say, uh, and, and say, I, I hope that that growth continues. Uh, I know that every issue, every cause it can be flavor of a month. I hope we have more than a month but I'm very much uh, enjoying uh, watching this grow and change, but also watching it grow and change and professionalize, because that's the other thing that's really happening. The anti-slavery world has gone from being, in a sense, a, a, an awareness-raising machine to being a liberation, rehabilitation, and reintegration machine, and one that, that operates with very strategic planning and monitoring and evaluation. And, and delivers a, a, the service of freedom, not just telling people that the problem's bad and needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Throughout this discussion, education has always been an important part, but education has been limited because so little was known about mm. the field. How important is it to begin educating young people about this subject? Not, I'm not talking necessarily about the college or university level, which I think we, we all understand, but very early on, perhaps even in elementary school. I, I think it's crucial, and, and I think it's crucial for two good reasons. One is, of course, as they, you, I have to say, having, having spoken to a number of, of young school children about this issue very carefully, you don't want to shock them with the horrors of it, but explain it. Um, you know, for them, it, it's truly a black and white issue. I mean, it's truly a clear, when they hear about what, that slavery might exist today and they understand what it could be, they're just morally outraged, and there's a clarity that you get with, with children and young people that's, that's very strong and very beautiful. That, that they internalize that early, and they hold that in their hearts and minds as they go ahead in life, is, a, is, is an early commitment to justice and freedom and equality uh, in, in ways that help them, I think, in other spaces. But the other part of it is that we, we need to train professional liberators. We actually, I think, are now, after having a significant input of financial resources into this space, are coming very rapidly to a crisis of human resources. That the only people who tend to know how to get people out of slavery today are the people who learned it over the last 15 years in the trenches, mm -hmm. dealing with those problems. And they're not the people who have stopped to teach others for the most part, because tomorrow is another day for them to, to help someone out of slavery. So I'm involved with some others and, and we're building training programs that we hope to, you, to make sure that when the time comes uh, and the demand for more liberators and managers of liberation projects are, 
are, are, is there, we'll have the people, the professionals to fill those slots. And what has been the response at colleges and universities in the UK and then also here in the United States? Well, it's, it's very positive. And one of the things that I think has been most exciting is that one of the ideas that we kicked around quite a few years ago is starting to come to fruition in that there are universities who are saying, we'd like to become a slave-free university. And there are cities that are saying, and Nottingham is one of them, who are actually embarking on a, on a project of saying, we want to become a slave-free city. And what that means is that, not that they're necessarily going to search every house and see if there are slaves in, in a city like Nottingham, which is a city of significant size, 150,000, 200,000 people. But, but to say, we want the citizens and we want the people or, or the students of this university to know what it would look like if it were around, would be able to identify it, would know who to call if they had a suspicion. All of that fundamental community, community watch ac activity. But then also to say, what about our products? What, what about our UCF jumpers and hoodies? Is there any chance that they could have come from factories where, or the cotton might have come from situations where there might have been slavery? Should we, we let's examine our product chains. And then also, what about our investments and our endowments? You know, do we want to make sure that we're investing in, 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 and drawing funds from the right kinds of companies that might not, who are doing a good job to look at for slavery in their supply chain? So being a slave-free university or being a slave-free city has several parts to it. And it's also just about helping a community to make a commitment to freedom. You were talking about how so many people working in the human trafficking field literally did on-the-job training. Yes. And now we're at a point where we have to train young people who uh, hopefully will find this uh, inspiring career path because, as you said, it's going to be around even with the best of circumstances another couple of decades at least. But what, what types of programs do you think would work best at colleges and universities? What kind of training uh, does a young person need to be effective in the anti-human trafficking area? There are two or three, and it's pretty easy to put them into segments. Uh, there is an academic component to this, even though we are talking about live liberation and getting people directly out of slavery. But the academic part is especially about learning from the past, learning from the previous anti-slavery movements. It's interesting that the current anti-slavery movement almost has an amnesia about the, the previous three movements and, and the successes and the failures of those movements that actually teach us a lot of lessons about what we should be doing today. But the other key part, and probably the most important part, is truly the professional training, the hands-on training, the kinds of things that you can only learn from people who have been getting people out of slavery on the ground for, for years and years. We're putting together in our new degree a, a very powerful content of that, of having people come to teach it who have who've been doing this for many years and doing this as their main career. But that has several parts to it. I mean, you, you're working with very vulnerable people, so you have to know how to deal with that. You have to understand no, notions of different levels of trauma. You have to do how, know how to do strategic planning around different types of slavery and how best to approach them. Uh, you have to think carefully about the process of liberation because it can often, and in fact is usually a dangerous situation. The, anytime you get to the point where you're about to take people away from a slaveholder, is when they want to reach for their guns and keep you from doing it. And then you have to be able to do the kind of monitoring and evaluation work that's expected in high quality social intervention programs in order to justify the resources that you put together and to learn from the past and do better next time. So do you anticipate being able to write the book, The End of Slavery, at some point? <laughs> is, is it realistic? Well, I, you know, I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote a book called Ending Slavery about how we might get there. And, uh, and in fact, there's a new a MOOC, a, a, a massive online open course that we'll be putting on again in the a four week free course for anyone online called Ending Slavery as well. I would love to write that book called The End of Slavery, but I, I don't know if I'll make it just because I'm just old enough that, uh, that if it takes a, a, a 30 or 40 years, uh, I, it might just exceed my capacity, but, uh, but I'd be, I'll be very happy when someone else can. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin Bales. It's been great. Thank you so much. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.